Okay. Welcome to um, the Polar Connect event we have today on May 17, 2012. We're talking with Polar Trek teacher Melissa Barker and um, the research team that she's working with. They're, they're in Tulik Field Station, which is north of Fairbanks, Alaska. And we're going to hear all about their work um, about nutrients um, cycling and nutrient transport in the Arctic watershed. So we're really excited that you guys are all joining us. Uh, before we get started with the uh, hearing from Melissa and the team, we wanted to um, give you a little bit of background about this platform we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And the, um, you should be seeing a slide that has the features of this, of this um, program that we're using. You can see that people are typing in the chat area. You can use the chat area for questions or comments, or you can tell us where you're from and how, how many students you have. Um, you can also, as we go along, you'll be able to, um, um, if you have a question as we go along, underneath the list of participants, you can click on the little hand icon, and that lets us know you have a question that you want to, um, to ask somewhere along the line. Um, the other thing is this event is being recorded, and we will uh, send out the archive later on. And I think that's pretty much of all the platform things that we need to know about right now. Um, participant introductions, if, uh, um, do we want to do that here? No, let's just, yeah, we won't do that today, but when you, if you can in the chat area, um, please introduce yourself, say where you're from, and if you have students or adults participating, um, write that in the chat area, and that keeps, lets us know who's joined us today. And as you can see, Melissa um, is using video today, so we'll at least see her picture and maybe the researcher when um, she's presenting. And um, they are, will be the only people that have video. We won't turn on video for anyone else because it gets a little crazy. Um, if you have any questions as you go along, just um, send Sarah or myself, Janet, a message in the chat area, and we'll try to help you as we go along. So why is Melissa up at Tulik Field Station way up here in Alaska? Well, she's part of the Polar Trek program, and this is where we match teachers with researchers, and they get to experience science hands-on in the Arctic or the Antarctic regions. And it's a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And it's been going on for a while. You can see in the slide it's been happening at least since 2010 and actually before that. And uh, it's just a great way to give teachers uh, a chance to work with scientists and to learn all about different kinds of science that's being done in the polar regions and bring it back to you in the classrooms. Um, we will, um, I mentioned this in the beginning, but we will be able to do questions. You'll be able to have uh, questions two ways. You can type them in the chat box as we go along, and um, we'll try to address them where it's appropriate and interrupt the speakers where it's appropriate so that they can be addressed. But also at the end, we hope to have a lot of time so that you can ask your questions directly to Melissa and to the scientists. And to do this, you click on that little hand icon above the list of participants, and then we will call on you. And um, we all have different kinds of uh, technology, and it works in different ways. So make sure when you talk that you are speak clearly and loudly and directly into the phone. And I think that's it. Oh, when you are using voice over IP and talking through the computer, it's important that you click on the talk button once that opens your mic, and then you unclick it when you are done. Okay, I think we're ready for your presentation. So we'll have your slide up here, Melissa, and I'm going to turn it over to you, and welcome. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Melissa Barker talking from Tulip Field Station. I'm a Polar Trek teacher, as Janet talked about, and also a science teacher at Alexander Dawson School. Um, I'm talking to you live from Tulip Field Station, and the picture you're viewing right now is our work site. This is where we go to work every day, and uh, we get that beautiful view of the mountains each day. And um, uh, that's the Alaskan pipeline, actually, that you see in the picture as well. Next slide. This is a view from the field station at 11.30 p.m. 
So as you can see, the sun is just barely setting now. And actually, from about, uh, for about two months in the summer, from May 26th, uh, uh, for two months, the sun won't set at all up here. I'm actually kind of looking forward to that. Next slide. So how did I get here? Well, we had to drive. I flew into Fairbanks and then had to drive all the way up. You can see that line there in the middle. Uh, that's the Hall Road or the Dalton Highway. And the University of Alaska Fairbanks has trucks that come up um, twice a week. And so I rode on one of those trucks. And yep, there's a the little pointer, thank you, Janet, um, all the way up over the Brooks Range. Next slide. This is a typical view from the Hall Road. And uh, the Alaskan pipeline was built to take oil from the north slope um, to Valdez. And this is a typical sub-Arctic forest of black spruce, birch, and aspen trees. And you can see the aspen and birch haven't leafed out yet, so um, it's a little barren up there. But um, this is kind of on our way to the tundra. Next slide. This is a rare segment of pavement um, on the Hall Road, which is one of the most isolated roads in the United States. Um, there's only about three, there's three towns along the road north of Fairbanks, and each of them has less than 25 residents. So it's a pretty barren place in terms of people and towns, and, um, but there are somewhere between 150 to 250 trucks that travel this road every day. So it's a big supply road. And for some of you students, you may have seen the ice road truckers. And um, part of that is filmed on this road. Next slide. Here I am at the Arctic Circle. So um, the Arctic Circle uh, marks the southern extent of the Arctic region. And anywhere above this line, the, um, the sun is not going to go below the horizon um, at least one day per year. And as I mentioned at two, like we're about 158 miles north of this line. So it's going to be, um, you know, we're going to have almost two months of total sun, which is pretty cool. Now, next slide. On the way up, we got to see a lot of wildlife um, and around Tulik as we're out doing our work. There are a lot of caribou, and so the picture on the top left and the bottom are caribou. And the males and females, um, it's the only uh, member of the deer family, so they're related to deer. And it's the only member of the deer family where both male and female have, horn, have antlers. Excuse me. And the males, males and females shed their antlers at different times. So the males need them for the rut and will shed them shortly after and start to grow a new set. And the females will actually keep theirs until after they've given, or just after they've given birth so they can have them for protection um, if needed um, during pregnancy. In the upper right-hand corner, that's a ptarmigan, and this we know is a female ptarmigan because you can see the neck is starting to change color. And the females, right now, there's big flocks of ptarmigan, and then they'll pair off and mate. And the, um, the neck of the female, or the, uh, the female changes first, and so that they can blend into the snow-free tundra when they're sitting on their eggs. And you literally almost can't even see them when they're sitting there. And um, the males keep their white feathers to show off for the females. And then they'll turn after the mating is over. Next slide. This is a view of where I'm living and working at Tulik Field Station. As you can see in the back, um, sort of right, top right side, there's a bunch of tents, the Weatherport tents. And that's where, that's the residential side of the camp towards the right side of the picture. 
And then towards the left side, that's where all the labs are. And each group has lab space so that we can do our work uh, when we come back from the field. At high time, there can be up to 150 people here at Tulick. So it really is like a small town um, in itself. And um, there's a lot of really interesting research going on here. Um, dinner table conversations become really interesting. And we talk about all sorts of research that's being done. Um, from squirrel, studying arctic squirrels and fish, to birds, bugs, and spiders, plants, and of course snow melt, and nutrient movement, and much, much more. So there's a lot of really interesting dinner table conversations. Next slide. This is where I'm living. So these are the dorm trailers. And you can see my room in the bottom there. Um, it's, it's really quite nice, actually. And the little heater in the corner, uh, that was pretty important uh, at the beginning of my stay here. It got pretty chilly at night. <laughs> They're saying it's nice and clean. Yeah, try to, you know, try to stay nice and clean. So um, the dorms are either usually the weather port tents or the, the dorms like I'm staying in, the trailer dorms. Um, there is uh, one heated dorm. But that's mostly for short-term stays. Next slide. So living in the Arctic. Living in the Arctic is, is pretty challenging, and building in the Arctic. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, those are supports underneath the dining hall. And the dining hall is the newest building. And these supports can be adjusted as the permafrost moves. So as it heaves up or down, they can adjust this to level the building. And um, also because of the permafrost, the picture in the upper right-hand corner, um, you see that the pipes, all the heating pipes and water pipes have to be above ground. Um, they can't go in the ground. So that's kind of different. And in the lower right-hand corner, waste is a pretty big deal up here. So we have to be really aware of what waste we're producing and where we're throwing it. We try to burn as much as can be burned, and that's burned here on site. And you can see the burn, no burn. So that's sort of our first point of separation all over camp. And then we also recycle um, glass, and aluminum. We crush the aluminum to save space because that has to be shipped down to Fairbanks. And then all plastics can actually be melted down. And um, they are sent down to Fairbanks also to be made into diesel fuel. Another big use of water is flushing toilets. And as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, these are the towers. And we use the towers so we don't have to flush toilets and save water. And you can see there's a sewage tank underneath. And um, that is pumped out. And the wastewater is taken up to Prudhoe Bay about three hours north. Um, we are allotted um, one two-minute shower twice a week and one load of laundry every two weeks. So we have to be really aware of our water usage here at Tulick. Next slide. So this is the water tracks team, or half of the team actually. Um, Tamara and Sarah. Um, Tamara is an ecosystem ecologist and biogeochemist. And she was the one for my students at Dawson. Remember, she was the one who came to our classroom. And she works at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Dr. Sarah uh, Gosley is a professor of catchment hydrology and geosciences at Idaho State University. And she is here with us today. So she's going to tell us all about the project. Um, and, Dr. and Jay Jones and Mike Gusev are also collaborators on the project. And they'll be coming up uh, later in the summer or in following years. Next slide. Um, Tim asked if those bugs were those were bugs on Tamara, and yes, 
Um, apparently, the mosquitoes get really, really bad. So yes, that's pretty typical, I hear, for up here. <laughs> Next slide. All right, the rest of the team um, consists of PhD students, grad students, and undergrads, and of course me there in the middle. Um, Caitlin is here. She's a PhD student with Sarah, and she's here all summer as many of the other team members will come and go. So Caitlin's going to be in charge up here at Tulick um, while, while others join her. And um, Margaret, Margaret and Becca will be joining us later. Molly was here to do some snow science early on and has departed. So um, we're, uh, there, will, there will be four of us tonight, actually, um, and then a few more to come. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Gazi uh, to tell you about the project um, that we're working on. So we'll kind of change over here. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. So for those of you who don't know, this project is a project to study water tracks. And if you're not familiar, water tracks are a little bit unusual. In this image, you can see some linear features on the hill slopes leading to the stream that's in the valley bottom. And those features have sort of a different color. The vegetation in them is different. So you can identify water tracks through a bunch of different ways. One of those is that the vegetation in them is often different. There are regions on the hill slope where there's higher water content. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll get to see a couple of different kinds of water tracks. On the left-hand side, there are some water tracks there that have much higher shrub content. They're bushier, shrubbier areas that are going down to the valley bottom. On the right-hand side, what we see is a region uh, where there's sedge, in, sedge vegetation in the water track. So this is closer to a grass. And what you can also notice is that they're lower topographically. So the, I think that person in there is me um, standing in there. And we're about, I don't know, a meter or so um, lower inside the water track than in the region surrounding it. If we go to the next slide, one thing that you might think about as we continue this discussion and that you might think about especially um, Melissa introduced some of the challenges of living in the Arctic and living in an area with permafrost. And permafrost is frozen ground, and that's part of what can control the formation of water tracks. We don't really see these in regions in Colorado or elsewhere in the lower 48 in the US. Um, we don't see such linear features. Instead, we might see rivers and streams that look more like the river valley on the right-hand side. They're sinuous or curvy. And water tracks are much more linear. If we go to the next slide, we can talk about why this might be. So part of this is that these features are permafrost controlled. So permafrost is just ground that remains frozen continuously for two or more consecutive years. And so if we think about it, we might have in a subarctic area, kind of like um, the picture that, that Melissa showed earlier, we might have vegetation on top. That's the green layer. And then we would have an area in the soil, the active layer in brown on the right-hand side, that thaws each year on top of the permafrost, which is sort of the light tan color, the bottom on the right. And those lines that are shown there show you the temperature. The red line is the maximum temperature, the blue line the minimum temperature, and that black line is the average temperature. And so what you can see is the active layer, the part that thaws each year, experiences the widest temperature range. So it goes from the warmest temperatures during the summer to much colder temperatures during the winter. And 
its average temperature is actually a little bit lower than it would be deeper in the ground. And so we have the sun that can heat things up in the summer, very cold winter temperatures. Here it can drop to about minus 50 or so this past winter, uh, minus 50 Fahrenheit this past winter. And then the permafrost um, is the area in the ground that doesn't thaw each year. So we care about this because the area that actually thaws is the area that water can come from and where the nutrients that are cycling um, have access to um, the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and any other chemicals that might be of interest in that active layer that's thawed. So if we'll go to the next slide. You might wonder why we care about these water tracks, these lines on Arctic hill slopes. And if you look across the valley, you actually might see faint images uh, that are slightly in red of a few of the water tracks on the far side of the valley. And then on the near side of the valley, you can see that um, the photographer and their shadow is standing right in the middle of the water track looking down slope towards the Kuparik River. And on the bottom left, you can see a little red dot, and that's a person for scale. <clears throat> so water tracks are really common in this area, and they occur in different concentrations, different frequencies throughout the Arctic. But one of the things that they have in common is that there are regions where there's a lot of water. And in the Arctic, the Arctic, at least in this area, is actually a fairly dry region. And it's only because it's underlain by permafrost that we see so much water at the surface. There's not a lot of precipitation, but we see a lot of water at the surface because it can't go down into the ground um, because it's frozen, the ground's frozen. So we look at water tracks to try to uh, understand how important these regions are where there's extra soil moisture for controlling the, the nutrient cycling and the biogeochemistry in Arctic hill slopes and in rivers and streams that flow throughout the Arctic. For example, the Kuparik River here in this picture is a really nutrient limited river. And so any extra nutrients that would go to that river might change its ecology. And so one of the things that we're interested in is understanding how water tracks process nutrients and how that influences what ends up in Arctic rivers, streams, and ultimately goes up to the Arctic Ocean. So I think we could go to the next slide here. So we're going to ask a few questions. And one of those questions is that we're trying to understand where water and solutes in water tracks are actually coming from. That might sound like a really simple question, um, but there's some complications to it. So this picture shows um, a an image of a nearby watershed, the white line through each of these images of the same location, that little white line in the middle is a creek. And the blue line that you can see that's circled in the upper right image is a water track. So blue colors here mean that the area is wetter, and red colors mean that the area is drier. We've got a picture here. These are model results. We've got a picture here for um, every six hours or so um, throughout a couple of day period in August. And so um, what we can see is that the water, tr water track stays wet throughout this whole period of time. But it's only during a rainstorm that occurs on the 26th of August that the rest of the hill slope also becomes blue, also wets up and connects the hill slope to the water track and then ultimately down to the creek that is in white down at the bottom of the valley. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that this is a model result. And so this is based on 
what what um, this modeling group thought was the most likely thing to be going on in this particular valley. And to our knowledge, this hasn't ever really been tested to see whether or not it's right or not. So that's one of the goals that we have up here is to say, all right, do we really see water tracks that always stay wet like this? And are they disconnected from the rest of the hill slope? Is the rest of the hill slope red and dry or not? And do they wet up and dry out as quickly as these modeling results suggest? So that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. And looks like we're talking about uh, one of the questions here is uh, asking about the differences between seasons. So if we go to the next slide, the really good observation, one of the things that we're interested in is how different those connections are between the spring snowmelt period and then the rest of the summer. And so what we have here in this image is that we have a period of time where you can see some of the snow still persisting in the water track, but most of the hill slope is already snow free. During the snowmelt period, the ground hasn't thawed yet to a very deep depth at all. Um, yesterday, some of our thaw depth measurements for the areas that were snow free were somewhere between just four centimeters, so a very shallow depth and maybe I think our deepest one was about 20 centimeters um, that had thawed already. And those were just in the areas that were snow free. And so you can imagine that flows through that very shallow layer might be really different than what happens later in the summer when thaw depths might be 50 to 70 centimeters. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about another big question that we have. And in this case, what we're doing is we're trying to use water tracks as windows into what's going on with nutrient processing in the subsurface. So what we're asking here is how far downslope nutrients might move as they cycle. And so you can imagine that if you didn't have any downslope movement at all, you could draw a circle that shows nutrient cycling. You would have uptake and release all in one place. But if you have downslope flow, you add in an additional velocity component. And so that uptake and release actually happens as a molecule is moving down the, the hill slope. And the distance that any molecule moves down the hill slope while it's being taken up and then released is something called its spiraling length. And that's never been measured in soils before because it's really hard to do. Most of the time, the distance that, it, that a molecule would be moving during its cycle is very small, maybe on the order of centimeters. And taking the measurements is difficult on that scale, but in water tracks, we think that the flows will be fast enough that we'll be able to do this measurement on the scale of meters instead. And so we'll actually be able to, to measure this successfully in a soil for the first time. So that's one of our goals. And if we go to the next slide, you might ask how we're going to try to answer these questions. And so I mentioned before that um, there was an image of the Kuparic River Valley. And this is one of the water tracks that we're studying that flows into the Kuparic River. We're looking at six different water tracks. Three of them are on an east-facing slope, and three of them are on a west-facing slope. Now, you might think that it would be better to compare north-facing and south-facing slopes, and that would be great, except for that we have a north-flowing river. So our hill slopes are facing east and west. So they still get different amounts of sun in different periods of the day, and we're taking advantage of the fact that they melt out at different rates. We're also looking at different slopes and different vegetation types, and um, trying to get as much variety and in our water track selection as possible to understand some of the variable responses that we might see from water tracks in this region. If we go to the next slide, 
this one shows some of the instrumentation that we've started to deploy. And at the bottom of the water track, we have an area where we're installing a flume. And in the bottom right photo, what you can see are two people who are installing plywood to block off the flows in the fall of last year and force them through a very narrow gap in the flow, in the wood rather. And the reason that we're doing that is that we're trying to measure the height of water and relate that to the flows of water through that area. We're also measuring temperature inside the water track on its edge and outside the water track at those locations marked with P. And then at the lines, we're measuring snow depths, water table, soil moisture, and the depth of thaw with a thaw probe, as in the blue one with the yellow handle that you see in the lower left image. If we go to the next slide, we can take a look at what the flow measurement looks like through that notch. And at the moment, we've left this notch wide to allow ice out to move through more easily. This picture is taken during low flows in the fall, during a really dry period this past fall when the Kuparik River actually dried up for almost two kilometers. Um, things are a little wetter right now. And we'll be installing a narrower necked flume here very soon. And I think that I'm going to turn it over now to Melissa, and she'll tell you a little bit more about what else we've been doing. All right. Uh, you can go to the next slide. All right. So what exactly have I been doing since, I, since I've been here? Well, first of all, a lot of equipment has to be deployed to the site. And some of that was done by helicopter, as you can see in the left picture there. And that was done uh, in the fall. And more uh, equipment had to be deployed when I got here. And I learned how to drive a snowmobile, which was pretty exciting. Um, and uh, we deployed more equipment. So that's one of the tasks we've been working on. Next slide. Um, other things we've been doing, we've built greenhouses. And the idea behind the greenhouses in the lower left-hand corner there is to accelerate, to try to accelerate um, snow melt on two of our sites. And the greenhouse worked really well when it was built in Fairbanks and uh, has been a little more challenging here uh, with a lot of the Arctic wind. And so we're we're making modifications to the design, and uh, we'll probably change that a little bit for next year. But um, I've also we've also been taking snow samples, and you can see me doing that on the upper right hand picture. And in this case, I was actually taking a surface sample um, because the snow surface there was a really pronounced dust layer on the surface of of this area. So we wanted to check that out in the lab and and see. Um, see how it might be different from the rest of the snow. And in the bottom right-hand corner picture, um, you can see two bags of snow. And that's how we um, hold the snow um, samples. And then we take them back to the lab. Next slide. So snow depth measurements, you can see the probe that we use to do that. So in the left-hand corner there, uh, left-hand picture, I'm taking snow depth measurements along the transect. And we take those about every two meters. And then inside the water track, we actually take them at each meter. The middle picture shows one of our uh, west-facing sites, which has melted out. This is the most melted site. And you can see that. Um, uh, well, the wooden markers, those mark the actual water track. And so you can see that the snow is persisting longer inside the water track than outside of the water track, where we're now taking thaw depths instead of snow depths. Next slide. Uh, we are also um, measuring snow density 
to try and get a snow water equivalent. So looking at inside versus outside the water tracks to get a sense of how much water is actually contained in the snow that is in those areas. And we're also looking at the layers in the snow pit um, that you can see in the bottom middle picture. That's a snow pit that we dug. And you can see that it's quite bushy uh, towards the bottom of the snow pit. And there's a lot of depth hoar, um, which for you Colorado folks, if uh, you're going skiing, you really don't want a, a snowpack with a lot of depth hoar at the bottom because it will be pretty unstable. So um, that was kind of interesting to see here. Next slide. OK, so back at the lab, we do water processing. And so this is uh, the snow. These are two snow samples in the left-hand picture that are melted out. And you can see there's a lot of debris in there. So we need to filter them, which is being done um, in the other two pictures. And we put them into three bottles. We call this triplicate. And those will be tested for different nutrients. Um, in the lab back in Fairbanks. And um, the bottle with the yellow tape on it, that's going to test, be tested for uh, water isotopes, for isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and that will give us some more interesting information as well. One next slide. So now we wait for the snow to melt. And the snow is actually melting pretty rapidly. In fact, yesterday we had our first flowing, almost flowing water sample uh, over the flume. So that was pretty exciting. And um, one of the side channels of the Kuparik River is starting to flow. And we caught a water sample there as well. So we'll be um, doing a lot of the measurements Sarah was talking about um, in this busy time as the snow is melting. Next slide. All right. Well, that's uh, a bit about our project. And we're happy to take questions. Um, Sarah and myself and Caitlin, the uh, PhD student, are all here and are happy to answer any questions that you might have about the project, about living in the Arctic, about what it's like to be a researcher, anything you're curious about. All right, great. Thank you, Melissa and team, for your presentation. Very interesting. So it looks like um, we do have some questions coming from uh, Dawson School. So I just want to remind um, the school that when you um, when you want to ask your question, um, click on the talk button to open up your mic. Talk slowly and clearly. Say your name. Ask your question, and then when you're done talking, click on the talk button to close the mic. Okay, we're going to go to Dawson School. Okay. Yeah. All right, this is Zach uh, R. from Period 5 Bio. <laughs> and my question is, as the snow melts, how much faster do you predict it will melt under the greenhouse? Will it be days or hours? This is Sarah responding here. At this point, you heard Melissa talking about some of our uh, wind difficulties with the, um, with the greenhouses at this point. Originally, when we designed the prototype in Fairbanks, where it's not very windy, we were getting temperatures that were about 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer inside the greenhouse. And so we would expect that the um, snow would actually melt out there probably days earlier uh, than in the area outside the water tracks. However, we haven't been able to get the greenhouses to stay closed nearly as well. So we have wind blowing through them, and the temperatures are not nearly as warm inside the greenhouses. We do have a few areas where it looks like they have melted out, but I think that for this, at this point, it's probably on the order of hours faster rather than days faster. We have two temperature sensors that we've deployed in each inside and outside the water tracks that are collecting temperature data for us. 
we aren't um, getting those back real time. So we'll be able to analyze them after the fact. But I think that we're going to go with a different design next year that's better capable of uh, handling the Arctic winds. There's a, another design that uh, another research team has used up here where they just laid black fabric on the snow. And you might think that that would be a good alternative because it wouldn't get blown around so much if you just sort of weighted it down with rocks or stakes. Um, but what they found is when they got rid of the snow so early and they didn't have a greenhouse over it, that the permafrost temperatures, the temperatures of the ground, would actually get much colder than the areas that still had snow on them. And we wanted to avoid this. So that's why we didn't go with the black fabric option. Um, but we're trying some new things, and I, I appreciate your question. That's a good one. Thanks. All right. Uh, Dawson, do you guys have some other questions you want to ask? Uh, hi. Um, Nick Reinard. I was just wondering, I know you already started talking about uh, the importance of it, but could you elaborate more on why you're, why you're going to the Arctic to study this and why these, uh, or how these affect or how these water um, tracks affect us? That's a great one. <laughs> so one thing I didn't talk about too much uh, earlier that I'll elaborate on a little bit more here is one of the reasons that we were trying to use the greenhouses, for example, and why we designed the project so that we would look at east-facing and west-facing water tracks is that we're really interested in how the Arctic hill slopes process nutrients and supply water to streams and rivers in the context of climate change. And so one of the things, one of the reasons that we came to the Arctic to do this work is that water tracks are really uncommon in other areas. And that's because this area here is underlain by permafrost. And so we have really high flows during snowmelt, but the ground is actually not thawed very deep during that period of time when we have high flows. And so um, these are really small sort of drainage areas that are coming to the water tracks and feeding water into the water tracks. And so in order to have erosion and channel formation, um, we'd need really high flows to do that. And um, the ground, since the ground is frozen during that period of time when we have high flows, it's typical that water tracks aren't channelized. And one of the things that we're curious about is if, ground, if the ground were to thaw to a deeper depth or if we had larger, uh, larger flows in the summertime, say we had bigger rainstorms in the summertime than, we've used, than we used to have as a result of climate change, how would that impact persistence of water tracks and how they um, cycle and process nutrients. And so that's one of the reasons that we came to the Arctic to look at this, is we were really interested in understanding how the, the control of permafrost at the bottom of the, the um, basin, sort of defining the bottom boundary through which water can flow and nutrients can be, can be uh, cycled, how does changing the bottom of that boundary affect those flows um, and those, that cycling? Hope that helps answer your question. Mm -hmm. Feel free to follow up if not. <laughs> I would also add that um, there is data suggesting that there is increased nutrients in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so we're sort of looking upstream from that and trying to figure out a little bit more about where um, those increased nutrients are coming from. Hi, this is David McConnell, okay, and okay, I'm just fine. wondering. Go ahead, oh, wait, Dawson. Is someone talking? <laughs> All right. Um, so I was just wondering what life is like on a day-to-day -day basis up at the um, site. Um, what do you do in the morning? You know, how how does your day play out? Um, good question, David. Um, so we typically are up at breakfast about 7:30. And then depending upon the day, if we're going out to our sites, which is most days, um, we are getting packed up, getting all the gear, lots of gear, loaded into our backpacks, 
And at this point, we have we were uh, snow, snow machining. That's what you call it in Alaska. Snow machining uh, out to some of the sites. Now we are snowshoeing, and soon we will be snowshoeing and walking both um, out to the sites, doing work out there. And um, some of our days we're out on the tundra until six, eight p.m. Um, soon here we're going to have a night crew that goes out from about 5 or 6 p.m. until midnight um, because the flows will still be running. And so I'm really looking forward to being out on the tundra at midnight because I think that's going to be a pretty cool experience. But I think because there's so much daylight, we tend to work really long days. So um, I've been surprised at the fact that I've been awake at 11.30, 12 o'clock at night most nights and, uh, and then getting up and doing it again the next day. So it's been really fun. I'm learning a ton. And um, so that's kind of what our day looks like. Okay, Dawson, another question from you? Uh, hi, uh, Kai Am. Uh, I have two questions. One of them is really quick, but uh, the first one is, I know you said by definition that permafrost is ground that has been frozen for over two years consecutively, but is there like deeper down, is it possible that like the ground has been frozen for hundreds of years or like is there any significance to how old or how long some of the permafrost has been frozen? And then the other question is really quick is, how's the food up there? <laughs> I'll take uh, I'll take the food question. The food is amazing. Um, I it's it's better than Dawson Dining Hall, which gives you a sense. Um, you know Dawson's pretty good, but um, yeah, the food is amazing. And uh, Sarah will talk to the other question. We had Pad Thai last night, if that helps. Um, and uh, <laughs> so the other question is a really good one. Um, so if we can go to that permafrost slide, that might be a good one to show as we're talking about this. So you, you were asking whether or not the ground might have been frozen for more than two years. And this definition that we talked about is really an, an operational definition. It's, it's something that we might use for engineering design, for example. And, um, and that's useful, but it's possible that the ground has been frozen for much longer than that. There were some colleagues who were here just this last week, and they went out to an area that was an exposed um, cliff face with uh, uh, permafrost that is, is known as yetima. So this is a really organic, rich permafrost. So when it thaws and, re and the carbon that's stored in it is released, it can add a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. So we care a lot about very organic, rich areas that might be thawing. And so they went to study this yetima cliff. It was about a 35 meter tall cliff. And two of our colleagues actually um, repelled off of the cliff with an ice core, and they went in and they cored uh, sort of uh, samples. They took samples out of the cliff as they were repelling off of it, and they are taking those samples back to analyze them for many of the same things that we're looking at in water tracks. And they have previously had taken a few samples just to try to get an idea of the dates using. Um, carbon dating, and um, they found that the deepest um, carbon, the deepest permafrost in this particular cliff was uh, around 45,000 years old. So they're looking at, at very old carbon um, indeed that's being suddenly sort of reintroduced into our modern carbon cycle. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Oh, actually, one other addition to that. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. One other addition to that, Kai, you should check out my journal um, on the permafrost tunnel. That will give you a little more information as, as well on the permafrost. Hi, I'm Nicole, and I have two questions. All right, Dawson, do you want to? <laughs> 
All right, I have two questions. The first one being, how has global warming affected this area? And second, have you seen a polar bear? Um, great question, Nicole. We have not seen polar bears. We are too far south, actually, for polar bears. I did see a grizzly bear on the way up, and luckily that was from the car. Um, but it was eating something rooting around at the side of the road and was pretty amazing to see. And we carry bear spray in case we do encounter any grizzlies. Apparently they really like our auto samplers that stay out in the field and we have to put electric fence around those. Um, so no polar bears down here. And then do you want to, what was the second part? Yeah. Oh, global warming. Oh, how we've seen any effects of global warming? I, I would say that I'll answer that question based on some other experience that I've had up here. For the last couple of years, I've worked on a project studying thermokarst. So that's a different, um, you know, a different word maybe than you're, you're familiar with, but it just means that ground has collapsed because ground ice in permafrost has thawed because it's warm. And so there's some evidence that um, those features have increased and that that's related to warming. So um, I'm happy to talk more about it, but if you want to hop online and look at, um, uh, there's a, a YouTube video I posted um, showing what thermocarst looks like. And you might check it out and just have some uh, ideas and questions. And we'll, looks like we've got to wrap up here. So, but I'm happy to answer more about it. Maybe we could do a journal about that mm -hmm. and, um, and we could talk more. So yeah, feel free to ask ask questions, and uh, we get to chat about these every night um, when we come back and do lab work. So <laughs> I look forward to hearing more from you guys. Um, definitely, as Sarah just posted, um, or Janet, um, please ask questions in the Ask the Team forum on my journal page, and we'll be happy to answer those as well, because I know a lot of you probably have questions that you didn't get to ask. And I'll put the link to Sarah's video, which is really cool. Um, about thermocarst, and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll put that up on the journal as well. All right, great questions, and um, yeah, make sure that you, if you didn't get something answered today, that you post it and ask the team forum. Also, we do have um, some a collection of, uh, of learning resources, which includes videos and some of these things that you guys are talking about already on the Polar Trek website. They're under the learning resources um, section. So you can just type in thermocarst or permafrost and you'll get a whole bunch of information about it. So some Sarah's video is already there. So uh, Melissa, you can just link to it um, through your journal as well as some other really fun videos and resources. So make sure you check that out. All right, um, there's lots of expeditions going on. There's two other teachers headed to Tulip Field Station. One's going to be up there pretty soon with Melissa, and, um, and Nick will be up there um, at, later in June. So um, make sure you follow uh, the Polar Trek teachers online, and, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. And we'll post the um, archive um, on the website um, in the upcoming days. And, uh, have a good time out there, ladies. Great job on your webinar, and it was great to hear everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, Dawson. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.